Hey everyone and welcome to the Year Was, the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party causing all your friends to question, hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? I'm your host Michael Montalbo and for the next few minutes we will swim through the river of time to try and find out what makes today truly unique. In this episode we examine the events that occurred October 20th. In continuing this month's theme of, well, whatever it is I'm doing, let's take a look at something that is not a curse or a superstition. Instead, let's go back only a week more and look at something that caused a lot of death. We have already explored a similar incident with Tim Kreitz in a previous episode, so let's talk about Leonard Skinner. According to their website, Leonard Skinner, the band, began 1964 in Jacksonville, Florida. They first introduced themselves to the world as My Backyard and then The Noble Five, before finally landing on Leonard Skinner. As the story goes, they chose this name because of a gym teacher who disapproved of the long hair they sported. I was going to say his teens, but they had it most of their lives. Leonard Skinner, the man, also apparently inspired the name My Backyard after essentially telling the band they couldn't have long hair in My Backyard, which in this instance meant the school. The group would ultimately go on to adopt and make Skinner's name their own. From Jacksonville, the band made the move to Atlanta where they began to develop a strong following, and that caused record labels to come look their way. It also caused people to look their way. That's a joke, because labels aren't people. It's not a good joke, and I may cut this bit out. MCA was the label that not only took notice, but was able to get the band to sign on the dotted line, and had the band recording what would be their 1973 album titled, Pronounced Leonard Skinner. When I first saw that, I didn't realize that was the album's actual name. From there, they went on to open for The Who, wrote Free Bird, and began work on their second album, Second Helping. This was the album that included Sweet Home Alabama, arguably one of the band's most well-known songs, second only to Free Bird. The song was done as a response to Neil Young's songs Southern Man and Alabama, which brought up understandable criticisms against the South, and Alabama in particular. By this point, it was 1977, and the band had released four albums, all to success. They began work and completed their fifth album, and by October 15th, not only had they added several new members, but they had also set out on a three-month tour. There is a Gilligan's Island joke here, but I will not make it, as it is in poor taste. On October 17th, the band's fifth album, Street Survivors, was released, featuring a cover of the seven-man band standing in the middle of a street, surrounded by flames, which were superimposed onto the image. Steve Gaines stood center, engulfed in flames, eyes closed. That will be important to remember for later. This brings us to... The year was 1977, and on this day, October 20th, the southern rock band Leonard Skinner's plane crashed killing six people on board. Before we continue, let's go back a bit to the summer of 1977. Aerosmith, the band, was looking for a plane to take them on tour. The plane in question was a 30-year-old Convair 240 that operated out of Addison, Texas. Aerosmith looked the plane over and met with the crew, but something just didn't sit right with them. The band's managers felt that the plane's condition was unacceptable and... They were reportedly unimpressed with the staff that manned it. Allegedly, they even saw the pilot, Walter McCreary, and co-pilot, William Gray, passing a bottle of Jack Daniels between the two of them, and they also failed their inspection. It was because of this that Aerosmith decided to pass on the plane. Going back to October of 1977, on October 18th, the band, Leonard Skinner, had a bit of a scare with that same plane themselves. According to History 101, on their flight to Greenville, South Carolina from Florida, while the Convair made it into the air, it only barely did so. Upon landing, a loud bang came from the starboard side and was followed by a gunshot-sounding backfire 
in a 10-foot stream of fire with sparks from the right engine. Again, here the band was unimpressed with the plane, but manager Peter Rudge was able to get it at a reduced price, and it had passed his own inspection. But then, he didn't have to ride in it. Rudge would be booked on a commercial flight, first class, instead. Going further, again to the 20th, there was some hesitation about boarding the plane, and backup singer Cassie Gaines shared her doubts. Ronnie Van Zant, the lead singer, simply responded, if it's your time to go, it's your time to go. And with that, Alan Collins, Steve Gaines, Cassie Gaines, Leslie Hawkins, Billy Powell, Artemis Pyle, Gary Rosington, Leon Wilkerson, and Ronnie Van Zant all boarded the plane with 18 crew members. The flight itself seemed to be like any other flight, at least until roadie Mark Frank looked out the window. Frank reportedly saw gas coming from the right engine mid-flight, and that never seems like a good thing. The engine then stopped, and the plane began to violently shake. The pilots attempted to keep the plane level and risked going into a spiral before the left engine stopped at around 10,000 feet in the air. As the story goes, it is believed that they were trying to transfer fuel from the left to the right engine, but instead dumped all the fuel that the plane had. Just prior to this, McCreary had radioed the Air Traffic Control Center in Houston that we're low on fuel and we're just about out of it. And then, we are not declaring an emergency, but we do need to get close to Macomb, an airport in Mississippi, as straight and good as we can get. And then finally, we're out of fuel. When asked to confirm, McCreary made the plane's last transmission of I am sorry, it's just an indication of it. The pilots alerted the passengers of the situation and Pyle instructed everyone on how to prepare themselves for the eventual crash. Billy Powell would later recall Van Sant shaking his hand and how everybody was sitting there praying. Ten minutes later, the plane hit the ground. Powell recalled, I remember we started clipping those pine trees. It felt like being rolled down a hill in a garbage can and being hit by about a hundred baseball bats at the same time. The plane skidded 140 feet once it hit the ground and traveled a total of 495 feet from the site of the crash. The cockpit smashed into a tree, killing both McCreary and Gray, while the fuselage was separated and seats were torn apart. The pilots were hanging upside down, still in seats, from nearby trees, Ronnie Van Sant and Steve Gaines both died instantly, while Cassie Gaines lay on the ground bleeding to death. The band's manager, Dean Kilpatrick, had been impaled by part of the fuselage and lay dead in a pool of blood. Powell's nose had almost been ripped off. Pyle had several broken ribs and was bleeding severely. Frank was covered in lacerations. Guitarist Gary Rosington had two broken arms, a broken leg, a punctured stomach, and a punctured liver. Alan Collins had two cracked vertebrae and almost had his right arm amputated. Some were unconscious, and others called for help, but help had to be found for the survivors. Pyle, Frank, and Ken Peden made the decision to go for help, and together they trekked through the swamp that the plane had landed in until they found a dairy farm. The farm's owner, Johnny Moat, first assumed they were in a car crash or were escaped convicts, but after some convincing, realized what had happened and set up a convoy to locate and rescue the survivors. When news spread, people offering help and people looking to collect parts of the planes, looters, were quick to the site. Gene Odom, one of the band's bodyguards, recalled how looters took his wallet, watch, ring, and money as he lay bleeding on the ground with a broken neck and blinded in one eye. I would like to think that only one grave robber was involved, but so many items were missing that I have to believe otherwise. The survivors were taken to Southwest Regional Medical Hospital in Macomb to be treated. In addition to those mentioned, other injuries included Leon Wilkinson, who was in such bad shape that his heart stopped twice on the operating table. Guitarist Gary Rossington would later say, 
It was always weird for Alan and me because we were up front in the plane. It was Steve and me and Ronnie and I was in the middle of them. Then on the other side it was Alan in the middle of Dean and Cassie. They all died but we didn't. We always wondered why, you know? The official cause of the accident was listed that the plane ran out of gas. Fuel exhaustion caused by an engine malfunction. Okay, you remember when I said that bit about Steve Gaines on the cover of Street Survivors and how that would be important later? The cover showed his eyes closed and he was engulfed in flames. After his death, the album was pulled from the shelf and a new cover of the band Standing was its replacement. Some think that the original cover was a bit prophetic, showing that he would die. This original cover would not be seen again until 2007 for its 30th anniversary reissue. A few days after the accident, Powell was asked if he thought there would be a Leonard Skinner after the crash, to which he sadly replied, I don't think so. In the years following the crash, the survivors have had to deal with not only the crash itself, but from the recovery associated with such an accident. The band took a decade to heal before the surviving members reunited in 1987 with Johnny Van Sant, Ronnie's younger brother, as lead singer, and began to tour and release new albums. The crash site itself is now home to tributes to the band carved into trees, as well as a metal stand with neon lights erected there to honor the six people who lost their lives. That's going to do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and helps steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the Year Was Audio version on your podcast app of choice. You can find me on social media and on YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Oh,